was that cartoon a little harder to read in the bulletin? I asked Miss Amy to go ahead and put it in there because it was taken off the phone. And so that background made it a little, but it was really good, like a Wednesday night Bible study. And folks who come for Wednesday night, that cartoon has that person asking, why study the book of Numbers? 36 chapters of self-centered people wind every, wind every time. They don't get their way. Give us something relevant. <laughs> so I thought, whoever sent that on the phone, folks do send me stuff. And every once in a while I say, that's good enough to put in the bulletin. Wednesday night, we'll move Sunday morning's message. Oh, Israel, waiting for the consolation. And another return to that. I feel let the Lord do that. And then I'll back up the, the temples, connecting the temple to Christ in the, the following week. So next week, Lord willing, like we changed so many things around this morning, next week, Lord willing, I'm going to speak on the second portion of wonderful words of life. Two words, so... I'll give you the rest of the um, 48 most famous quotes from John Maxwell. I'll give you the other portion of those and some others. Two words that can change everything. Jesus saves. Jesus stays. Jesus secures. Jesus sanctifies. Uh, you, won't, you won't hear more life-changing words than that. Um, uh, I asked Brother Mark to speak. And just something the Holy Spirit, I felt, led to do on Tuesday, preparing for the funeral and different things. I was thinking um, one or two comments of folks, how much Sunday school meant the week previous week. And I'd already been leaning towards it. Every once in a while, we got to have some revival Sundays. we got to have some uh, some guest speakers. we got to have some people who have the heartbeat of our church. And, and so I thought, hey, since the Sunday school lesson was so highly recommended, I'll have Mark speak at for our second service, if he would. And th those that were here, <clears throat> the few that were here, you know, he can add an extra point or something. <laughs> but Mark does have to stay up here. I know it, it's, it's nicer, and I even would like to come down there with a stand and be closer, but this allows us to stream it and it be magnified. Folks sometimes say we're clearer and louder on our streaming than we are when we sing live here. So we have to stay up here. That really helps us. Mark, come speak for us. Right. We're going to be in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, and if you got that, you got that up already, April? Awesome. Oh, very good. So Matthew, chapter 5, let me turn there. We're going to be looking at verses, what's in there, verses 17 through 26, which we looked at last week, so those of you who heard this already, Appreciate you bearing with me. For those of you that this is something you've not heard uh, in our Bible study, well, I, the prayer is obviously that it's worth your time. But we're going to start off with a prayer. It's going to be on the screen. I'll, I'll read it from here, and they'll change the screens over. One of the things we've been trying to do as we've gone through the book of Matthew is each section that we look at and study, uh, trying, to, trying to write a sonnet, which is just a 14-line poem. There's a lot of other things that could be said about it, but uh, something as a kind of a way of praying the text back, and uh, it's been very helpful for me to try to understand what it is we're reading, to not only understand it, but to also try to live it. So in our Bible studies, we've been going through the book of Matthew, we'll read these prayers, and then we do a group reading aloud, and we're going to do that today with you as well, and I'll let you know the verses I, I'll have you read. And um, but if you look on the screen, follow along the screen with me as I read, this is a prayer called The Great Lawyer, which is not intended to be an oxymoron, by the way. Uh, Emmanuel, you came to fulfill the law. Did the multitudes on the mountain see what you meant? For who could make that claim? Prophets of old kept their lips sealed. They knew Messiah's work and knew they weren't the one anointed to bear that burden. They spoke the law, which man gelded, made an idol, or cast aside for one's personal truth. Yet the prophets, like wise men, looked for you. They pointed to you so others could hope in truth. And you came with Holy Ghost and fire to purge the Pharisee heart, to quell the madman lust autonomy. You are the greatest of heaven's kingdom. So if we look at Matthew chapter 5, 
verses 17 through 26. We will not read all the verses as a group, but I'll read verse 17 aloud. If you read verses 18 aloud, and then I will read 19 aloud, and if you read 20 aloud, all right? And then we'll, we'll get into a closer look at it. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Very good. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Very good. All right. So if we go back to verse 17, Jesus is speaking what's known as the Sermon on the Mount, um, oftentimes called the Olivet Discourse. Uh, I like to call it the Mountain Sermon. It's just a little easier to, to, to say there. But he begins, if we go back with me just for a second to the beginning of chapter 5, he is speaking to a multitude. And in the first couple of verses of chapter 5 has what is known as the Beatitudes. And the word Beatitude simply means happy. Here's how to be happy, right? And uh, what's important, I want to draw that out, is that's one of the main concerns of all human beings throughout the history of the world. It doesn't matter if we go back thousands of years to an agrarian world where there was no electricity, where there was no internet, where people were living off what they could draw from the earth themselves or that they could hunt. They were still concerned with... <laughs> Am I happy, right? What is the point of this? And even the modern human being is very concerned with, does this make me happy? Am I fulfilled? And I'll come back to that word fulfilled in a minute. And Christ, through what's known as the Beatitude, says, here's how you are to be happy. In fact, the word blessed in the Greek here is, is a translation of the word happy. Here's how you are to be happy. And he goes through, and his very first thing is, you have to be humble, the poor in spirit. And he goes through, we'll jump down to verse... 11, the whole Beatitudes have this ascending in difficulty. When he goes to verse 11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And he'll go on then and talk about people being salt and light, and there's the verse there. If you look with me at verse 16, the verse that students at Mercer Christian Academy say every day at their morning assembly, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your good looks. Let's glorify your Father which is in heaven. And every, mo every morning at Mercer Christian Academy, the students will recite this. And uh, the few times I got a privilege to be there and sit in there, it was a very, a very good thing to hear. Whether or not it sinks in in the moment, That's, that needs to take its time, but we, are, we have a life to live ultimately for the glory of God. So now Christ comes to verse 17, and we'll get into what we're going to be looking at here today. He tells the audience, he's just walked through this Beatitudes. If you want to be happy, you're pretty much going to do everything the opposite that the world tells us to do, and you're going to learn how to endure very difficult things. And lest I forget, Christ is the highest example of someone who would endure difficult things for the will of the Father. And we see this in the crucifixion. But he goes into verse 17, he tells the crowd, he says, Look, think not that I am come to destroy the law. The word destroy here means to dissolve, to dilute, to make it of less effect. So when he is preaching to the audience and he tells them, if you want to be happy, here's how you can be happy. And keep in mind that the audience who's listening to Christ then is an audience of Jews who live in their own land, but they do not live free. Their land is occupied by the Romans. So just as a fun thought experiment, imagine with me today, if you could, if the Ru Russians were to come and occupy or if the Chinese were to come and occupy, right? 
occupy our land and give us some level of freedom where we could still meet like we want today and worship, but we still had to pay tithe to the Chinese government or the Russian government and had to pay homage to the Chinese leaders or Russian leaders or whatever country, right? As long as it's not the Dutch, right? Just kidding. But if we were to stand up here today knowing that we were living while being occupied by a threat, how happy could we really be? And even though we are not occupied today like the Jews were, who in here does not have something very difficult in your life right now? Even down to the youngest kid in the room. The youngest kid in the room knows in just a few hours, Monday morning's here. And I've got to get up and I've got to go to school. And I've got to get to school on time. And I've got to turn all these things in. And I don't have these things done. And then the parents of those young kids, they're also dreading tomorrow morning. Because they know, I've got to get up. And I've got to get my kid there. And I've got to go work there. And we've got to do this. And all the other people who work on Monday morning. And all the people who have lost someone that they care about. Everyone who's been lied about. Everyone who has some sort of physical ailment right now that they're dealing with. Everyone in the room who doesn't know how they're going to pay their next bill. Everyone who knows that death is rapidly approaching. Who among us doesn't have something to be sad and grieve over? And yet Christ comes into his audience then, as he speaks to us now, says, here's how you ought to be happy. But don't think that I'm coming to destroy the law. The reason he says this, or one thing that he's addressing at this moment is, there were two major things going on at the time of the crowd that Christ is speaking to. On the one hand, he has people who loved the law. They obsessed over the law. They knew the laws in and out, and they could follow the law. These were called the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you had people who were saying, we don't need a law. We don't need the traditional law of our fathers. We don't need the Roman law. Every man can be a law unto himself. So if you imagine two extremes, right, we would have a totalitarian, to use that type of language, right? Total control, everything on the outside matters, and then complete anarchy over here. Do what we want. And think of all the different levels that go in between that spectrum, right? And if we apply that to the church, think of how much the church has struggled over the years to cast off some old ways, some traditional ways. That probably should have been cast off, but not all of them. Think of the new things that are being incorporated. How much have they really helped? So when Christ speaks to the audience, he says, I am not coming to say of the Old Testament, it doesn't matter. And one thing our pastor said multiple times from the pulpit, if you want to understand the Bible, you have to understand the Bible, Old and New Testament. And the study we're going through on Wednesday nights now is a way of saying, look at these Old Testament stories and hear how they're completed in the New Testament. So Christ says, I'm not come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but fulfill. And here's what the word fulfill means to complete it. I'm going to complete the law. And he will complete this law, even though the congregation that he's speaking to does not know what you and I are aware of, he will complete the law by dying, by being buried, by rising from the dead, and then sitting on the right-hand side of God the Father and being our interceder for us. He will complete the law. He doesn't tell the audience that right now, but he says, I'm just here to fulfill the law, to make it complete. Verse 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. Here's what Christ is saying. Everything in the Old Testament, whether it was something massive, and we'll talk about one of those massive things in just a minute, or whether it was something insignificant, and we'll talk about those in just a minute, They both matter, and God sees and God knows. And every prophecy that was said to be fulfilled will eventually be fulfilled. And ultimately, it will be fulfilled in Christ, and Christ will be the judge. And we'll get to that here in just a few minutes as well. But until heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle, nothing from the Old Testament shall pass from the law till all be fulfilled. In other words, we don't get to look at the Old Testament and say, well, that doesn't apply to today, or that doesn't matter today. Verse 19, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. We'll put it in school terms just for fun, all right? 
how can a teacher demand of his or her students to show up on time when he's always late? And not just a minute late, 30 minutes late. How can a teacher demand of the class, you need to have your work turned in, your own work, when that teacher doesn't do his or her own work, his or her own preparation? How can a teacher tell a student, you need to listen to the, what we're going over and the advice we have and the counsel we have when that teacher is too arrogant to learn himself or herself at the feet of someone else? When Christ tells the crowd here that even the smallest law, if it is broken, if you go on and teach as if you are not breaking that law, you are now the least in the kingdom. And that might not seem like a big deal on the surface, but to the Pharisees, it is a big deal. But how much is being the first a big deal still today? To reference sports, we talk about the GOAT, right? Who is the greatest of all time at this particular sport? And the conversation I'm exaggerating a little bit, goes a little bit like this. You are either the goat or you're, to borrow from our current slang, trash. There's no in-between, right? Human beings are obsessed with a few things, living forever, always being right, and always being number one. Not much has changed in human history. And Christ comes onto the scene and says, here's how you can be happy. You're going to do the exact opposite that the world teaches us to do. And we have to have the law in place, but don't, if we go around saying the law, the law, the law, while we're breaking the law, we're actually the least of these. If we go around acting as if we're the best, Christ knows that we're not. We're actually the lowest. Verse 20, for verily I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm sure the scribes and Pharisees love to hear that, right? Because Christ just paid them a compliment. Unless you know the law, like the scribes and Pharisees, you are not going to enter in the kingdom of heaven. And I imagine they're sitting there going, yeah. And I love what Christ does here because he's really setting the Pharisees up to cut their legs out from under them. But who, throughout the history of the world, is the only one who broke not even the least of these and yet taught them? It is Christ. It's why the prayer is titled The Great Lawyer, because how many lawyers know the law but yet will break the law just so they can get their client the best deal? Christ comes on and says, I know the law and I, comp I, I will complete the law. I say and I also do what I say. And that's a, a struggle that all humans have, right? We all struggle to do what we say. So now we go to verse 21. We're going to get into some details here, all right? Verse 21, ye have heard it said of them of old. So as you go through this Sermon on the Mount, you'll see that Christ has this phrase. In other words, you've heard this said before, but I'm going to tell you this. Now, what he does not do is say the old doesn't matter. He's saying, here's the old. Now I'm going to show you something a little bit deeper. And there's one principle when we study the Sermon on the Mount to keep in mind is the Jews were very good, the audience, and we today as humans were very good at outwardly doing the things they were supposed to do, but inwardly. They, had, they did not trust God. The law for the ancient Jew many times was, this is what will save my soul, even though they were told it couldn't, or this is what will get me status. I can follow this and, and get what I want, but inward, and they were using the law as a way of identifying themselves as Jews. We're not the Romans, we're not the Greeks, but they were not in their heart of hearts committed followers of Jehovah. Verse 21, ye have heard of them, you have heard that it was said of them of old, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. So if you look up here for just a second, what we're going to see Christ do is he's going to start off with murder, right? Killing here is not killing in self-defense. He is not arguing against uh, military actions, right, of all kind. He's not arguing against a police force. Murder, right, to kill someone who is innocent. So he puts it up here. That's a huge one, right? And he says, if you commit murder, you will be guilty of the judgment. And the word judgment here refers to the human law that you will sit in front of. You will sit in front of a court. You will sit in front of a judge. You will be judged, and you will be punished and sentenced accordingly. All right? So it's going to work like this. Now watch what he says next. Verse 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, 
So if we were to tell you today which is worse, murder or anger, we'd all say well, murder, definitely. is definitely worse. And just as there are degrees of sins, that doesn't mean that the least of the sins is no longer a sin. So Christ is going to start with that external thing of murder, which everyone says, man, that's wrong. We don't want to stand in front of the judgment. And then he's going to go into the heart of a man and say, but anger without cause, look at the rest of the verse, shall be in danger of the judgment. He repeats the word judgment here, but in the Greek, he's now referring to the divine judgment. Angels and God himself who can see into the hearts of men. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. So he moves down a little bit deeper, and he moves up a little higher to who's judging. Whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. He goes deeper into the heart of man, and the deeper we go into the heart of man, the higher we go into the punishment. So let's look at these words just for briefly. The word kill uh, refers to murder and homicide. Judgment has that justice, the law that you will stand in front of. Angry. Here's what the word angry is. In its original language, it means to stretch out and touch. And when we get angry, what do we normally want to do? Reach out and lay hands on someone, right? There's a physical manifestation of that anger that comes out. But he says here not to be just angry, but it's angry without cause. Angry over something for which we should not be angry over. And I'll be very specific here. If someone abuses a small child, we can't come to this verse and say, well, he told me not to be angry. So I don't want to be angry at that because the abuse of a child is absolutely incorrect. As we move, as we looked at our study today, adultery is wrong. Murder is wrong. What he is saying is, how often are we walking around so easily offended at things that we shouldn't be upset about, and we are just holding on to that without cause? He's saying that is, that is wrong too, and God can see into the heart. We can have right reason to be angry with someone, but it is worth us stepping back and saying, is the reason I'm angry right now, is there the right reason for this? Not a justifiable reason in my own mind, but is it something that matches up with Scripture? And then he goes on to the same verse. If you say, Racha, if you call another human being empty, senseless, empty-headed, or here's the one, worthless. Now, we probably all call people stupid from time to time. We have all probably been called stupid from time to time, right? But what does it mean when you call a human being worthless? It means that they are not made in the image of God. It's very easy to say someone is worthless if they are an accident of the universe. One of the worst things someone can say to a child is, you are an accident. We never wanted you. You're worthless. You're no good. One of the most damning things that a spouse can say to that spouse is, you're no good. Unless it's true, of course, right? But Christ is saying, you might not be killing people, but inwardly and with your language, you are speaking of another human being as if they are not made in the image of God. Look what the rest of the verse says. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, you are, the word fool here has to do with, you are beyond redemption. You are godless. It's a deeper level of not being made in the image of God. Because guess what God can do with his image? He can redeem his image. God loves his image. He has chosen his creation. Now, what's tragic is that his creation will reject him. But it shows just how much deeper the love of God that he continues to pursue after that which he has created. And how dare we, as a human being, to stand back and say, okay, I've not committed murder, but in my heart I have no right reason to be angry, and now I've taken a step further and I've called this person absolutely worthless beyond redemption. And he says, you shall be in danger of hellfire. And the word here, hellfire, refers to what was known as the Valley of Hinnom, which was a valley that sat outside the city of Jerusalem, and it's where the garbage and the dead dogs were burned, and the fire was continuously going. There is a judgment for the soul who ultimately rejects God. And there's a judgment for our works even though externally we might act as if we're doing what's right, but if inwardly we're filled with hate, those works are going to be burned up as well. Verse 23, 
So now how does this apply to the religious person, to the person who's trying to follow Christ? Because we all get angry, right? And we all, from time to time, get angry without cause. Verse 23, if you bring your gift to the altar and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. If you realize, if I realize in a moment, man, I'm angry against someone without cause or... If I've been angry against someone without cause or I have wronged someone, we can't come up here and bring an offering or a prayer and expect God to answer the prayer. As he, we will see later in, the book of Math, in, later in the book of Matthew when he gives us a Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who've sinned against us. So if we know that we have anger without cause... We need to go make that right with the person. If we know, and if we know that we have angered someone, we should make that right. We should apologize. However, what do you do when you know that apology is never going to come? What if the person who has been wrong to you and has made you so angry to such a level, and that person is now dead? Or you know that person has offended a little one and is never going to, at least to hold our breath for an apology, it's never going to come. What do we do? Now that has to go to the Father. We are not responsible for the person next to us. And to demand that and wait, we can be mindful of the anger we have in our heart, especially if it's anger without cause. And as the statement goes, to err is human, to make a mistake is human, to forgive is divine. And what would Christ say on the cross? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What would Stephen say as he's being stoned to death? Forgive them for they know not what they do. Sometimes people commit things against us that they don't even realize it. How many times have we done something to someone we didn't even realize it? Right? And when we are called out on that, it is best for us to apologize and make it right. But if we're the one who the wrong has been done to, and we should not sit here and hold our breath and wait for an apology, but to make sure now that anger does not set up without cause. Because if we can say, hey, you did this thing that's absolutely wrong, and everyone agrees, even God agrees, we can still let anger start to set in. And now it becomes an anger without cause because we're not trusting for God to work his will as he should. Verse 25, agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him. Lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge and the judge deliver thee to the officer and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the utmost farthing. One of the things Jesus is driving home is if you get into a dispute with someone else, as much as is possible, try to resolve the, resolve the dispute. Resolve it correctly. Because uh, there are some disputes where you're, you are at odds with someone who has an authority over you. And if it's not handled correctly, they have under the law the authority to take you before a judge and you'll actually lose the case. But Christ is talking about something a little bit deeper here. Because remember, he's not focusing just on the external. He's focusing on the hearts of man. And what he is saying to the audience is, who is the ultimate one? that we wrong when we commit wrong? Who is the one that we're ultimately rejecting, rejecting when we have anger in our heart towards another human being? We are ultimately committing a sin against God the Father, the judge before whom all humans will stand. And Christ is saying here to the audience, if you go through your life refusing to ever make things right, especially with the Holy Father, there will come a payment that you will pay Till the very until you pay the last farthing, and the truth is, that's a payment that will never be fulfilled. The eternal damnation that awaits the souls who reject God is an eternity without God, and they will be making that payment forever. And we can stand back and say, "Man, that is awful," and it is awful. The proper response is that is tragic. It's tragic for the human being who's made in the image of God has chosen to reject the one 
who has made himself known in the external world and has made himself known in our very souls. As Solomon would say, we all have eternity in our hearts. We have an awareness. We are all without excuse. And to reject him, there is coming. A, there was a judgment that is coming for that. So as Christ, we, um, for those of us that are in the adult Bible class, we moved on to verse 27 today and finished up through verse 47. So I will just jump to 47 to refresh that because as Christ moves throughout the Sermon on the Mount, again, the biggest thing he's focusing on is the external does matter, but we can so often get caught up in the external that we're not paying attention to the internal, to the internal. Our faith is not in God. We are doing these external things for our own reasons, and we're not drawing closer to God. In verse, 40, verse 48, Jesus gets to a point, and he'll, he'll get to kind of a stopping point before he moves into what's designated as chapter 6. 48 says, Be ye therefore perfect, as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. The word perfect here comes from the Greek word telos, which means the end. We make a big deal in church, and we should, and in Christian schools, and we should, on the beginning. In the beginning, God. We make a big deal about creation, and we should. But we were not created without an end in mind. And when God made human beings, the end was that they would draw back to him and be perfect and would live their lives for him. And one of the things that Christ is driving home in this Sermon on the Mount is, is the life that you are living being lived only for these external things or for yourself or is it ultimately being done that you glorify your father right so that others can glorify their father and are you drawing closer are we drawing closer to our father so verse 48 when christ says be therefore perfect the word perfect here means telos be fulfilled be complete in our father which is in heaven so if we want to be happy if we want to be satisfied, if we want to be fulfilled, there are external things that we can seek, but they will not bring that satisfaction. It is with Christ first, and he will bring the external to a greater or lesser degree according to his will and our efforts. And what Christ is also telling the audience is, this life is not all that there is. It is a huge part and a very important part But there is life after this. And that is where we will ultimately be complete. So when we approach Monday morning, not to put on some type of false happiness, right? Because got to go back to work, got to go back to school. Or when we are sick or we have these grieves in our souls that aren't going to go away, we can still find a deeper true happiness to know that this is not the end. There is a day coming for which we were made when our happiness and our entire being will be complete and fulfilled in Christ. And Christ is telling his audience, don't do whatever you want now and just hang on till the end. Live now knowing the end that's going to come. A very poor analogy, but what we'll end end it with is, if your parents leave you at home, as often we have been through our days, and they leave They know how we're supposed to, they leave instructions for what we're supposed to have done, right? And along with that is how we're supposed to behave. We can sit on our hands the whole time our parents are gone and act like savages and get it done right there at the very end, or we can act as my parents are coming back and have expectations that they have laid out for me, and even in their absence, knowing that their absence is one day going to be their presence, I'm going to always try to behave as if the moment we are united is going to happen. And this is exactly what Christ is telling his audience. And we do know, we we have seen so much unhappiness in our world. The rise in depression, the rise in suicide, a, a litany of other things that are happening. And yet we have a greater and greater push for pursue your dreams and get your material pleasures and Follow this and follow that and do whatever you want. And Christ is telling his audience, unless Christ is at the center, our happiness will never be fulfilled. We were put here at this time, but we were put here at this time because one day we will have an end and we should act accordingly that our end, our ultimate completion and satisfaction is in our Father which is in heaven. All right, we'll pray. Lord, I do thank you for today. I thank you for the the patience of the audience, uh, the the time people have taken to be here today. 
And I ask that you would bless your word in, in spite of myself and that we would strive to please you with our life and to know that you care about our bodies and you also care about our souls. And we thank you for your love for us. Amen.